Thank you for joining us at uh, this very important panel. Uh, this panel is uh, focusing on uh, addressing the crewing crisis, the Cyprus approach. Uh, in addition to the fact that uh, crewing is a global issue, uh, the crewing crisis, Cyprus has made a number of far-reaching innovative proposals how to address and alleviate this global crisis. So we're delighted to have with us a great uh, group of panelists. George Teliakiris from DNV is going to introduce the panelists and uh, uh, guide us through the, the discussion. And But we have the minister, the deputy minister, uh, Mr. Dimitriadis with us, who is going to kick off this panel by providing us a review of the major initiatives that he has put forward and also announce uh, again the plans for next week uh, with the implementation of some of these plans. Thank you. Uh, Minister, and thank you to everybody for being with us. So thank you, Nicholas, and uh, thanks to all the panelists. Uh, good afternoon to all our viewers. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to the COVID pandemic and, and the seafarers' uh, welfare, uh, we all say that uh, seafarers are our invisible heroes. But I believe it's our duty, first of all, to make them visible to recognize their role and what uh, their contribution uh, to global uh, trade, to global economy, their role in providing uh, to all of us uh, in facilitating the transfer of cargo uh, to our houses, to our hospitals, uh, all the necessary good that we, we do need on a daily basis. And of course, the, the pandemic and the crisis uh, provides the opportunity to highlight the importance of the seafarers. And also I must say there is an incident in the, in the Suez Canal. But let me just, uh, I mean, highlight and uh, inform our viewers what Cyprus did uh, during the last um, 14, 15 months uh, to facilitate, uh, to respond to this humanitarian crisis for our seafarers. So first of all, from the very first day of the pandemic, we have um, recognized that seafarers are essential workers and we have introduced practical measures uh, to, to help our seafarers to facilitate crew changes and repatriation. So since May last year, I think more than 15,000 uh, member, crew members or seafarers were uh, facilitated their repatriation or the crew change through uh, our ports and airports here in Cyprus. And even during the times of lockdown, we have uh, uh, continued to make the crew change and repatriation possible. So in, uh, our uh, initiatives to help and to recognize the role of seafarers was not limited at the national level. We have introduced and we have presented a global vaccination approach for seafarers, uh, communicating this approach both at the global level to IMO Secretary General, but also within the EU with the competent commissioners uh, at the EU. And also we have submitted it to ILO. Basically, we, we have presented a practicable and realistic approach to vaccinate the seafarers, uh, taking into account the specificities uh, of the shipping sector. So for, for short sea shipping, for short distances where seafarers and crew members are frequently calling their home countries, we said that it's a responsibility of, uh, it's a national responsibility to incorporate seafarers on their national vaccination plans. But for deep sea shipping where crew members remain on board for more than two weeks, we said that it makes perfect sense to recognize that seafarers on board are considered a COVID free isolated zone because they spend more than two weeks on board together. An emphasis should be placed on seafarers uh, ashore. Seafarers that they are on their home countries waiting uh, to get the, the vaccine and then they can freely uh, travel by air, transfer to a port and make the crew change possible. So we signal the importance 
of placing emphasis uh, to seafarers ashore. This is also uh, applicable to any kind of vaccine because if you are ashore, you can get the two shot vaccine, you can get the one shot vaccine. So we call the global shipping community, the ICS, ITF for a mapping exercise to see the magnitude of the problem. So we can collectively uh, ensure adequate number of vaccines because we do believe that uh, we do share, all, we all share the same principle that shipping is global, it's of a global nature. And basically we should, we should uh, work uh, towards providing global solutions. But this should not be the case when we face um, uh, regional threats, like it was in your previous panel discussing about uh, decarbonization, which is a, there is a threat for regional measures and therefore shipping is global. No, we should act also globally when there is a humanitarian crisis like the one we are facing now. So we have signaled this approach to everybody and our approach uh, was adopted in the form of an ILO resolution. So this was an important development and Based on this resolution, the, uh, the social partners, uh, they were encouraged also to engage into a mapping exercise. And now we are working together to seek more concrete solutions. And we are also trying to mobilize other like-minded countries, other maritime nations that they do acknowledge uh, the role of seafarers. But since we, we have a leading role in in promoting uh, seafarers' welfare, in promoting a vaccination program globally, we also feel responsible to do something at the national level. So uh, what I have announced this morning, and I would like now to provide more information, is that Cyprus, as of next week, it will be ready to announce that all seafarers working on board Cyprus ships, no matter where, where the ship is, and all, all ships calling at Cyprus port with a relation to Cyprus, either manage or Cyprus or using Cyprus, but we will clarify more on our circular for that, will be able uh, to ensure a vaccine for their seafarers. Under a special uh, procedure, we are now in contact with the Ministry of Health to clarify all the relevant uh, logistical details. And next week we will issue a circular that Cyprus is ready to go a step further and ensure adequate vaccines for our heroes. Because for us, these heroes are not invisible. They are visible. We feel, we acknowledge how much they support a global economy, global trade. And uh, of course, another point that we would like to explore further is how Cyprus could contribute in in, in the global vaccination program. Uh, and we would like to exchange with um, the social partners at the global level, the possibility of Cyprus becoming a vaccination hub under certain conditions, of course, because I'm afraid from our national quotas, we don't have this availability, but if we engage with other countries, of course, Cyprus, could consider and explore that possibility also. So we are here, we, we are showing our social responsibility. We stand next to the, uh, our seafarers uh, and we are ready to provide uh, support. And we will continue, of course, facilitating crew changes, facilitating the repatriation of seafarers and uh, ship owners flying the Cyprus flag of ship owners or operators that they have any connection with Cyprus, next week they will be ready to hear our new procedure, how we can make, uh, we can ensure vac vaccines for their seafarers on board the ship. Uh, on a more general note, how we, would, how we are promoting the seafaring profession, how we, uh, let's say, building a culture uh, among our young people to follow the seafaring profession or to follow the maritime studies and, and the blue economy in general. We have recently launched a program 
uh, which is under the name Sea Your Horizon. We, together with the, the shipping community here in Cyprus, we are trying to promote the seafaring profession. We are trying to promote shipping as a, a sector with a lot of uh, potential, with great career development. And I believe that we will manage to attract a number of young people to follow this profession. But before doing so, we have to show that we do care about these people, we do care about their welfare on board. And that's why Cyprus is moving with these initiatives, showing its uh, social responsibility. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Dimitriadis. I thought Nicholas would make a remark here, but that's fine. Uh, I think what you have just announced, it's quite, um, uh, it's quite interesting because it takes a step further. Nicholas, would you like to make some no, remarks no, before no, we start? No, 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 George, thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, interesting announcements, uh, so uh, definitely. I mean, whatever initiative Cyprus has taken, as you correctly said, it, this takes it uh, a step further in the right direction, I would say. And I would echo your comment that basically uh, shipping is a global business. It's not uh, a regional issue. And when there are opportunities global, the same thing should apply when we have problems. There are global problems and everybody should chip in. So thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Dimitriadis will give us the honor and he will stay along uh, the panel. And then we thank him uh, for that. Uh, but let's uh, start our panel. I have my, my name, first of all, as because uh, Nicolas Brunoz said, is George Teriakidis. I uh, work for DNV and I'm the area manager for East Mediterranean. I have the pleasure of coordinating this panel. Uh, today with us, we have a, a group of uh, professionals that know uh, this business and the topic of crewing quite well. Uh, first of all, we have Mr. Dimitris uh, Chrysostomo, who's Group Director Marketing and Business Development in Columbia Ship Management. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jan Meyering, uh, Joint uh, Managing Director for Marlow Navigation. Thank you, Jan, for being here with us. Uh, Mrs. Julia Anastasiou, Deputy Managing Director at OSM Maritime Group. Thank you, Julia. And Christos Caravos, Director for Hotel Operations at uh, Royal Caribbean. Thank you all for uh, spending, uh, for giving time for this um, panel. I will repeat the title, which is uh, quite uh, broad, and we have a lot of uh, area and topics to cover, which is uh, the crewing crisis, Cyprus approach, focusing on vaccinations, crew welfare, and maritime training. Now, uh, we will start. I'll have some questions to uh, which we will take a rotation, and each of the panelists will, uh, will reply. Hopefully, we'll cover all questions, because all uh, topics of vaccinations, welfare, and training are quite important, have been, and even now in this uh, crisis. Let's start with the first uh, topic and question, uh, which is about the known issue of COVID and vaccination of crew. Uh, the minister already covered uh, the initiatives that Cyprus is taking and the latest uh, step forward. And uh, my uh, question to, to you all uh, would be that, I mean, up until now, we are a year and a half into the COVID crisis, COVID situation. What have we learned so far? I mean, we would love to hear, and everybody watching us, the experiences that you have so far, um, and what uh, actions you see that uh, the maritime community needs in order to move forward. Cyprus is a good example, and uh, Mr. Dimitriadis already uh, put across one of the initiatives. And I think that here, and Mr. Dimitriadis mentioned that, is the issue of collaboration. Have we achieved enough collaboration in, among the stakeholders? quite a lot of issues to cover. I will start uh, with the lady of our uh, group, uh, Julia. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, George, for that. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, a very good question, and I'm glad that uh, we'll start uh, straight ahead into this one in particular. I think, first of all, it's important to state that um, we are extremely resilient as an industry. We've had our procedures and processes, our weaknesses, our strengths, all of the above put to test. And although we've experienced extremely steep learning curves, all of us, in fact, and really have been thrown into the deep end in completely uncharted waters with this pandemic. 
most of us, in fact, I would say majority of us have managed to keep our heads above water during the challenge uh, during this pandemic uh, time. And I think one of the areas that uh, we've learned to focus on uh, is being positive rather than dwelling on the negative aspects. We've learned to become much closer as a team and together with our customers, we've acted proactively to review various solutions uh, to the daily uh, challenges that we experience. Some of the examples of our proactive solutions are from my organization that we've hired a COVID-19 task force global head. And this person presides over company protocols, uh, aligns offices and liaises with necessary, both internal and external stakeholders to coordinate all efforts. Um, we have very detailed COVID-19 booklets um, where also the requirements regarding quarantine and PCR testing have been specifically um, specified and are permanently under review as is necessary. Um, Secondly, I would say that uh, one of our major learnings has been in our ability to be agile. And by that, um, we found ways to come across and come around the logistics issue. And uh, we were in a very um, positive position to have the good fortune to charter a number of aircrafts during this time where we were able to mobilize our crew and uh, have them transported safely and when needed. I think on a third note, um, the collaboration as has been mentioned earlier, uh, has actually helped us to a great extent. We have tapped into several of the industry colleagues, either those that we're working together with, and that has strengthened our commitment as an industry to really band together and come up with various initiatives that would help us get through this, including one which is the Neptune Declaration, which a number of panelists uh, here are already uh, members of, as is OSM. And there we provide information on crew change indicators and we focus on the well-being of seafarers globally. We have also been extremely instrumental in lobbying for the rights of seafarers to be classed as essential workers and uh, thereby ensuring and allowing them to have less stringent conditions imposed on them and to have them recognized as workers who must be prioritized by governments, especially for vaccination programs. So I think um, the fact that this was something extremely new to all of us and the fact that we had that very steep learning curve basically threw us in a position where we had to think out of the box. We had to be proactive. We had to use all the resources that we had within us, including some unconventional means that we would not normally turn to in order to um, turn this around and make this as successful as possible. And, and I think one of the ways forward would definitely be that we continue the collaboration that we started with our fellow colleagues. Okay, thank you, Julia. Um, personally, I'm happy to hear that there are some, I mean, as you said, there are always some negative things around, but it's very positive to see that there has been collaboration and we have managed as an industry, at least at most part, to come together at least for a common, uh, for a common goal. Uh, taking, uh, uh, I mean, going to Jan, uh, from your side, have you experienced something similar? Anything more to add? what Julia said. Yeah, good uh, afternoon first to all and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I believe we all experience the same circumstances, but uh, before we go a bit more into these details, I would like uh, to refer to the minister and uh, his announcement that they will actively start to uh, vaccinate people and he was referring to visible and invisible uh, heroes. I fully agree. Um, this is very close to the um, slogan, uh, seafarers are key workers. And I was uh, very happy to see and to hear that in an earlier um, uh, panel, uh, when um, uh, it was discussed about uh, when they use the majority of their time for referring the industry has to remain attractive and uh, young seafarers still should join uh, the industry. Um, they were talking about improved seafarer situation and deviating vessels to effect crew changes. And uh, I believe that uh, also in an earlier panel, the attention to the seafarer was given and we are all aware uh, that they are the ones who keep things going. And it was mentioned uh, that 90% of the goods in the world are transported. So indeed, the seafarer should be a key worker. 
Now, unfortunately, even with the announcement with the, uh, by the minister uh, Dimitriadis that uh, Cyprus eventually become a hub for vaccination, um, this is one more stone uh, of what we need. Um, but we need, I believe, in addition to an initiative here in Cyprus, an initiative uh, all over Europe. And uh, there I must say that uh, the initiatives are still very, very limited. And partly uh, individual countries um, make vaccinations available, but only for their flag and only for uh, seafarers who are linked to ship owners uh, with an address in the, in the country. So therefore I'm, I'm very happy to hear uh, that Cyprus will uh, go even further and uh, we will be as Cyprus again one uh, of the leading uh, countries to uh, go in the right direction. So that's very, very good and, and very much appreciated. Now, on EU level, I would really strongly recommend that we come to a point where if every second or third country in the EU would uh, roll out a vaccination program for ships coming into the ports, we would be able to achieve a lot. And then I refer to countries like Rotterdam, uh, Antwerp, um, Greece, definitely a hub where many ship uh, owners are and management companies are located who have a responsibility to move things forward. I believe if we would only take every second or third country within the EU and vaccines would be made available and on arrival of the ship, or let's say after the clearance of the ship, one hour later, the crew would be vaccinated, I believe we would have to a large extent the uh, seafarers being on vessels within Europe, we would have them vaccinated. Eventually not all the ones on a tramp trader, but we could still apply the Johnson vaccine, at least for ships which don't stay within Europe. And uh, as much as I appreciate Mr. Dimitriadis, his uh, announcement, very much appreciated. Uh, I know that he has very good contacts to Brussels. I believe he should apply this to really come to a European approach and to add many, many additional hubs to Cyprus in order to get uh, this rolling out in a much faster pace. That's from me for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the comments. Very valid. I mean, instead of having a localized initiative, better spread it out. And definitely, like you mentioned, in, in Europe, European countries could have done more, to say the least. If I would, if you allow me to, to, to add even, if we don't Please. see the European countries alone and we would consider even places like Gibraltar, like Suez, like Panama, so really locations where ships are passing by. Yeah. And if eventually there would be an international initiative via the WHO, I believe we can achieve a lot as a joint effort because the seafarers are key workers and they deserve this attention. Thank you. Yes, fully agree. Very valid comments. Thank you for your comments. Uh, let's move to the next gentleman, uh, Dimitris. Uh, can we have your views on, uh, on the topic? George, thank you very much. And also thank you to Captain Link for the invitation. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Dimitriadis for his comments. Um, I think if more governments had the same approach, we would be in a much better position. So we appreciate these kind of announcements. But like Jan said, a lot more has to be done by others. Um, I will approach this question a little bit in an unorthodox manner, maybe a little bit controversial. And I won't refer to, let's say, what we've learned as Colombia on operational level. I think Julia has covered uh, all those pretty well. I mean, all major companies have done that, so I don't want to repeat these things. Um, what I will say is, if we consider shipping uh, and the shipping industry is controlling over 90% of the world trade, I think we can all agree that the shipping industry is a superpower in its own right when it comes to the control of um, the trade and the world economy. Uh, if we look on the other side at the voice of shipping and the influence of shipping that it has on international level, uh, politically and governmentally, uh, I think we have to agree that that voice is not that strong. Now, uh, Mr. Dimitriadis mentioned the ever given in the Suez Canal, so I will refer to that. And if we can remind ourselves that when we had the grounding of the ever given in the Suez Canal and the disruption of about, about 20% of world trade, the ever given made uh, global news 
daily on the major networks for at least three to four weeks. In the developed nations, at least, this became a household name they were given. Uh, uh, people became more aware because it affected them somehow on a personal level and also it affected the world economy. So now, hypothetically, if all the shipping industry was to come together and shipping was to stop, I mean, ask yourself the question, would the government still not consider the seafarers' importance? Would they still class these people as second-class citizens? Would they still be invisible? So this is, like I said, controversial. It's a bit extreme, but it's just food for thought. And I think the message what we should take from that is that I think the shipping industry does have muscle. And I think the shipping industry should find ways, of course, not extreme ways, but find ways to come together and to exercise that muscle and to exercise the influence because it is an important player in the world. It, does, it is an important player for every person's day-to-day -day life, world economies. And I think there is the ability, if there is also the initiative and maybe the creativity to actually come together and find ways which they can actually influence themselves. Because at the end of the day, a lot of it in the shipping industry is actually left to individual companies to deal with. Uh, the support in, let's say, people coming together, companies coming together to actually speak and to get um, to push forward uh, initiatives which the ship are important to the shipping industry, I think we have a long way to go. And so that's, that's just my message in a slightly hypothetical, controversial, extreme way. But at the same time, I think there's a message there that, that could be taken on board uh, for everybody listening. Uh, that's all from my side. Thanks. So are we still on? I think we lost uh, momentarily, George. You must be coming back. Oh, okay. Okay. I thought for a moment I was speaking to myself. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe one of you has uh, a comment to, uh, to follow on on what you were saying, so we keep the discussion going. I think what Dimitri's uh, addressed is very important, the macro and microeconomics that um, uh, obviously a global commerce has to do with the shipping industry. I think it's so important and vital that we tap into that and, and we just continue the dialogue on those lines. I wouldn't say it's controversial by any means, Dimitri. I think you're hitting the nail on the head. And I think for us as an industry to really then develop that further, that would be something of a takeaway away from, from this panel. Um, whether or not some nations have considered seafarers as essential workers or not, that is just the, that's just the icing on the cake, so to speak. I think the main issue that we see here is that uh, shipping itself hasn't really been in the forefront and, and we as players of the shipping industry have not been there to support one another so that the visibility is actually where we want it to be. And I think that is really the underlying issue here. So we need to come together, we need to collaborate. What we've started is a good start, but we're not where we need to be by any means. And again, I don't necessarily like uh, drawing parallels with other industries, but if you do look at what aviation is doing, um, we are behind in that respect. And there are a lot of learnings that we can gain from, from just simply looking into what they do and the practices that they have. And, and that for me is something that is extremely important. It should be our highest priority, not simply seeing what we can do on a local level, even on a national level, but what are we doing on an international level to safeguard our future and the future of our seafarers? You know, the, uh, we have had uh, the privilege to, to host uh, several panels on uh, the topic of crewing. Um, the minister participated, uh, you know, a few days ago, about a week ago in an international conference, exactly discussing his proposals. Um, to address the crisis. And I think one of the conclusions is the will is there from the part of the industry, but we have been talking about this thing for months. 
And I don't know if the progress that has been achieved is proportionate. Well, anyway, yeah, I, I fully, I fully agree with you that uh, we talk about it not only since months but uh, more than a year. Uh, but I have sometimes the impression that we who talk about shipping, about uh, transportation of goods, goods, uh, we are very, very well aware how important uh, the seafarer is to keep the ships uh, sailing. And uh, I'm not really always sure whether the public um, considers when they get goods from China, um, if they are aware how it's transported, what is behind, what it took to bring the goods from China to Europe. And there is, I believe, we are lacking. Uh, among the shipping industry, uh, forwarders, I believe, yes, they all understand how important the seafarer is doing his daily job on board the vessels. But uh, unfortunately, if you go further, as uh, Dimitri said as well, the uh, ever uh, giant was uh, continuously in the press. But on the other side, who will talk about a ship which is performing its schedule, arrives on time, loads the cargo, discharges the cargo, and uh, does it work uh, and, and, and works fine? Nobody will uh, have any um, anything uh, reporting about that. But I will pass on now to George. Um, I well, sorry one, about that. Yeah, I will leave one comment with George and I'll uh, disappear. One of the things that we have talked about across the board is uh, when it comes to decarbonization, crewing, everything. It's very interesting that a lot of the decisions that apply on shipping are actually not made by shipping people or people who have a stake in shipping. It's done by politicians, by you know, governments and so on. So I think it is very important for the, for the industry to be more proactive in terms of putting the message out to those broader decision makers. Anyway, George, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, by all means. It's, uh, I think uh, Dimitri, uh, I can see that he's doing a very good job as a business developer. He has changed the topic totally, but uh, it's uh, definitely uh, a very valid discussion on how shipping can influence uh, uh, the rest and politicians and everything. But moving without moving any, uh, without losing any more time, uh, moving to Christos, uh, COVID vaccination, COVID crisis experiences and collaboration that you have seen from your side. Hi, George, and thank you for having me. Uh, from our perspective, I think the pandemic has shown uh, how resilient the uh, maritime community is. And in many ways, it has brought us a lot closer together and worked together than worked separate as units. And in the Royal Caribbean group, uh, you know, we looked at it at various, uh, various aspects of our, side, uh, of our side of the business. We, we, we created a COVID-19 uh, panel in regards to creating all our protocols for our crew and our guests. And we cooperated with the Norwegian group uh, as two uh, of the largest operators. And we created the same protocols. And then we decided to share those protocols with CLIA, the Cruise Line uh, International Association. So all the smaller operators can benefit from such uh, protocols as the ones created from Royal and Norwegian Cruise Lines. We also took the time to build our training platforms. We, we took time to build our crew welfare and what is our seafarers on board. And we all understand that the, the cruise ships have a lot more crew than any other uh, industry. So, you know, on average, we have a thousand to 1500 crew per, you know, on each ship of ours. So we looked at uh, reinventing uh, the privileges and the crew welfare on board and what we offer for our crew to make it more attractive and to uh, make it more comfortable for them when they come back uh, to work. We are trying to work with the various uh, governments uh, as a group, but as an industry as well. Uh, there is a lot of considerations and a lot of discussions how we create vaccination centers in our main uh, uh, sources of uh, seafarers, the Philippines, Indonesia, India, working with the private sector there and working with uh, the government sector as well and create our own vaccination centers. So our seafarers go there, they get vaccinated, we cover the cost and then they join our ships. Uh, I very much welcome uh, Minister Dimitri Addis announcements. Uh, so, you know, I'll be calling you Minister when I come to Cyprus to discuss a little further. 
But, uh, you know, I think we need to continue what the pandemic has forced us to do, and that's to cooperate between all maritime industries. It doesn't matter if you are a tanker or a car or a cruise ship, we still have our seafarers, and then we need to take care of those uh, individuals. And, and I was very much involved in repatriating a lot of our crew, and we used our own ships yeah, in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. We used our yeah. own ships in Europe. We use our own ships in India, and we have chartered a lot of planes to send our 50,000 crew across the world to the various countries. It wasn't always easy uh, between the government regulations, the aviation regulations, the countries you depart, the countries you arrived, but we managed it and we have done our very best that we could. And I think coming together as a unit, it will bring results. And I agree with Julia when you, you say that other sectors like aviation and so on are a little bit ahead of us. And we have a little bit of, of ground to cover in regards to that, again, working as a team. Thank you, George. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Christo. So I take it that basically, yes, we have seen collaboration. It hasn't been as global as we would like uh, because we have seen some initiatives here and there. Uh, however, different stakeholders have come together in order to push things forward. Um, and uh, so, yes, we have learned something. Uh, Christos mentioned about crew welfare, and I think being on the topic, uh, we, I would like to touch that upon. And in order also to manage a little bit of time, there is an element as well of, uh, first of all, crew welfare, the one and a half year that has passed due COVID, I think has been uh, overshadowed by the fact that there is COVID. And, uh, the crew in crisis and people getting stuck on board or ashore has been basically an issue. Um, however, there is also, I'll join this with another aspect, which is that, yes, the crew has been going through some hard times and we call this a crew in crisis. However, there has been probably another element, maybe a forgotten aspect, which is all the people ashore trying to assist the people who are on board and trying to manage all these aspects. So we will put this together. What elements of crew welfare probably have been missed out, if I can say that, and not exactly missed out, but overshadowed. I think that's a better English word. And um, how the office and management and people handling all the situation has been for each of you, uh, from your own uh, point of view. If I can go back to Julia to share some of her experience and thoughts. Absolutely. Uh, obviously, for me, I do not see any difference between the essential crew that we have working on board our vessels and the essential workers mm -hmm. that we have working in our offices. Everyone has been stretched to the limit. Fatigue has set in uh, for everyone. We were tested uh, beyond our limits to some extent. We have had to basically reinvent the wheel almost on a weekly basis, if not on a daily basis, simply because what is a norm today changes tomorrow. Standards are continuously being uh, revised. So what was definitely needed and was recognized at a very early stage was to have something in place to not only deal with fatigue, but to try to understand and recognize when we see problems looming. So mm. what we tried Being to do as an Precisely, precisely. And not only that, but having a means whereby people can actually have that outlet to reach out to those uh, that can provide some help for them. So for the seafarers, we chose to turn towards holistic medicine. And by what I mean by that is that we've had a hotline set up through our Nordic Medical Clinic that serviced the global group. And that could also be used for our shore organization. We had dedicated people within each office that um, had additional training that were there to help and assist in, in times of need. And even for those who simply had um, steam that they need to let off. You know, this was an extremely unconventional and continues to be an extremely unconventional time for all of us. So a lot of this is also trial and error. And I think one of the learnings is that, as I mentioned earlier, together we are stronger and we have grown stronger and we have seen through our resilience that we've been able to overcome many issues. But I think it's important to also address the fact that there is a huge elephant in the room right here. And it's not only about the welfare of people 
people missing crew changes or having extended contracts? What about those who are stuck in quarantine uh, facilities? What about those who are not only tested positive once, but twice? What about those stories that we hear about of suicides and what happens then? That just doesn't affect the seafarer who has unfortunately passed. That affects everyone that is involved in a case like that. And I don't think there is enough that's being done on, um, I would say, an international level to address these issues. I think individually, we're all doing the best that we can. As Dimitri said very clearly, yes, I mentioned a few of the learnings and that has been adopted by basically most of us in one way or another, and we are doing what we can. But again, there is not enough pressure put on this topic so that we get the traction that we require. And I can't thank the minister enough for really being um, the leader that he is to actually proactively go after this and set the tone and try to make headway on an international level by starting on a national level. But again, until that's adopted globally, we are basically treading in uh, murky water and we're trying to yeah. save ourselves in, in one way or another. So I think we need to definitely have a lot more highlighted attention on this subject. I don't think that there's enough. I think that, again, welfare is a very deep and extended um, conversation that we can have that can go on for days. But I think we need to really put focus on this now that we've lived through the first 18 months, now that we can anticipate what could potentially be around the corner and look towards how we can, um, I would say, take the processes and procedures we have today and adopt them so that in post pandemic times, we will continue being resilient and help our seafarers to overcome some of the challenges that they're facing today. Yeah, take the lessons learned basically and move forward, apply them. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Julia. Uh, Jan, from your side. I can only agree with Julia and uh, I would like to express that uh, the last 18 months uh, were difficult. They were difficult for the seafarers on board. They were difficult for the shore staff. If I just uh, recall in the beginning, uh, uh, when we had to set up the IT, uh, depending on uh, the local national regulations, uh, we had in some uh, regions to bring uh, all stuff uh, in a home office. So that had to be set up. It was a, a really um, hardware and software issue, uh, but uh, we managed quite well. Um, we, were, we are here in Cyprus with about uh, 300 uh, colleagues and worldwide with 1,000. So it were suddenly hundreds of colleagues had to move uh, in a home office, which was definitely demanding. But also the seafarers were confronted with a situation where uh, they wanted to go home and couldn't go home. So definitely they did their part. And I must say, from what we saw in the last 18 months, they were very professional. They were really um, up to what uh, could be expected. They uh, understood. Uh, things were explained as well as to the staff ashore. So I believe with an open channel going to the seafarers uh, on board, as well having an open channel to the colleagues um, within uh, the office and in the home office who were really um, were confronted with uh, a new way of working, I would even say. Um, we should uh, thank uh, both parties uh, for the excellent uh, job done. And let's be honest, at the end, we kept it going. And this was with the seafarer, with the staff ashore, and uh, the shipping industry continued to deliver the goods. And um, we should not uh, exclude uh, the family of the seafarers, uh, because uh, also our branches in the home country of the seafarers had to build up a close link to the families to understand why eventually the father, the daddy, the the son cannot come home, so it was really an effort uh, to be close to the seafarer, to be close to um, the staff and to be close to the families. And uh, I must say overall, a fantastic job was done. And I can only thank everybody for uh, the efforts um, at any company who is active in shipping. I believe uh, we can sell really well done. Thank you. I don't, I don't think we cannot, we can you know, say that we, we all agree fully with your comments, Jan. 
spot on. Uh, moving, looking at the time also, sorry about that. Moving to Dimitris, your quick comment. Yeah, George, I'll be, I'll be quite brief. I mean, it's a good question because I think we, it's very easy with the problems that we are facing to forget about the silent heroes, if I may call them that, uh, who are behind the seafarers and, and the day-to-day -day operations. And so the stress on these people in the office has been tremendous. I mean, I think you also have to consider that when working from home, people are not only, let's say, there's the challenge of not having the personal communication in the office with your team, but people tend to work a lot more hours. So it's not just the True. stress, the anxi anxiety, but it's a lot of hours being worked. And I just want to touch on one thing, which uh, maybe some people, you know, people not involved in the day to day and, and a little bit outside the crewing where, where there might not be an appreciation. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples from a technical superintendent's point of view. Um, I've been spending more and more time in our Singapore office uh, due to my role as also managing director of the Asia region. Um, and we have... Um, Superintendents who've attended dry docks in China, and just to show you what they had to go through. So I had a superintendent who did 21 days of quarantine on arrival in China, did about a month and a half in dry dock, and then came back to Singapore and did another 14 days of quarantine. So just for a routine dry dock, which in the normal world would have been very routine, you know, this is one superintendent who's been out that long. Behind him is his family and so on. So it's, it's, it's again, um, the stresses of these people are equal maybe uh, seafaring uh, seafarers is, is obviously harder because they don't know when they're going home they don't see their families on a daily basis but there are people in the office facing similar challenges and at the same time at the moment we even have five technical superintendents who are stuck abroad unable to re-enter Singapore due to the semi-lockdown that Singapore has at the moment yeah. so, the, so the challenges in the, in the office I think are quite silent uh, not as visible, at least for us in the shipping industry, where in the shipping industry, the seafarers problem is more visible to us. But I think every person has his own personal challenge in the day-to-day -day job he does. So it's a very good question and appreciated that that was brought up on the panel. Thank you, George. Thanks, Dimitri. I think, uh, the, I think we go back to what Julia said also at the beginning, that the work has been going on. Everything has been uh, moving on. Like Jan said, shipping has delivered. However, we all had to think out of the box. We had to think of new ways of doing things, sometimes not in the best and most efficient way, but we kept going. And we should at some point go back and think on how some of these will be lessons to avoid or to adopt, actually, um, in the near future. Uh, Christo, uh, will you close this round of uh, comments, crew sure. welfare and the off situation, please? Uh, from the crew welfare perspective, I think it should be a, an industry uh, focus, and, and I think we need to work as an industry to, uh, uh, you know, and share best practices of what we do as companies uh, for our crew. You know, I can share for Royal, uh, you know, the Royal Group, we provided balcony cabins, upgraded food menus, free Wi-Fi, uh, we had religious services uh, through, the, uh, through TV channels. We have therapies uh, or, you know, in Miami to provide any consultation uh, that the crew needed to talk to someone. Then we had uh, you know, various people, specialists in that department. One of the most innovative thing that we, uh, the Royal Caribbean group did is they put X amount, they created the Royal Crew Fund and they put X amount of money into that fund. So if you are a seafarer at home, six, 10 months uh, that you didn't work and you have financially uh, you know, challenges, you could apply online and you could get up to $15,000 uh, grants uh, you know, from the fund. And we have thousands of our crew to keep going with their scholarships, with their, uh, with their mortgages and everything else that they had to do. For, for the shore side employees, of course, everybody ended up working from home. So, you know, the company will provide you with the monitors and a desk and a printer and everything else that you needed. But the best of all is the Richard Payne day off. So our chairman and CEO said every couple of weeks, this Friday is the Richard day off. So nobody could work, uh, no conference calls were allowed and everybody had to be offline unless it was a critical emergency. And I can tell you, it was greatly appreciated 
most, most likely we all work on that day because we caught up with all the emails that we had to deal with from previous but days. silently, and, you know, not... Yeah, no silence. I think it was an amazing, uh, you know, initiative that came from our executives. And you're giving me good ideas right now for our uh, company. So, but that's the whole point, George. I think each company did various things of what they could, and if we can share those things, I think as an industry we can create very good standards and crew welfare for our seafarers. You know, someone to talk to, uh, someone to communicate with funding for various things that they need. I mean, all these things are critical to people on the ship and off the ship at the same time. True, true. And uh, indeed, we need this kind of exchanges of ideas. Uh, I fully support this view. Uh, however, I will also highlight what Julia said, that we need, at the end of the day, all of us, to try and test, you know, in our capacity of our companies, of our position, new things and different things, because unless we try something, we never know what's, I mean, nobody has gone through this before. Let's face it. So uh, we are walking in a dark room, trying to, you know, feel where is the, um, how to proceed forward. Uh, now, closing the panel, and uh, hopefully if we have some time, Mr. Dimitriadis can give some closing comments as well. Uh, we have the topic of training. Now, training has been, ongoing and it's been a highlighted topic for many, many years. Uh, however, during COVID time, uh, I'm sure training didn't stop. And uh, I'm sure that one way or the other training has changed. Um, I've seen it in our company, but uh, I would love to hear uh, shortly from each of you uh, experience that you have with the crew training. And uh, do you think uh, we will go back to what it used to be before? To something new or what to what we have today let's hear it from uh, julia i'll be very brief because i'm very cautious of the time um i can say 80 percent of our training has shifted to i learning uh other than the mandatory simulator required training yeah. um, courses that obviously cannot be substituted and i definitely see this as something that we will carry through as a positive you can customize it based on the circumstances of your individual customer within obviously a, a defined framework that you can uh, maneuver within and i think obviously from a cost aspect there there are tremendous savings um, not only for the customer but for the organization itself uh, it has proven to be a little challenging because it's something new Normally in a classroom environment, you have a set time, a set timetable, you have your instructor and um, you invite people to attend. When it's online, it's a little bit tricky then to gauge if people are really uh, taking it in as they should be, if they're participating yeah. fully, if they're comprehending, even though there is an instructor available. So I think initially we did have teething problems and, and that's inevitable when you're introducing something new, but going forward, definitely it will be the way of the future. Future. It already has proven to be effective. We've been testing it. We've been engaging our customers and also testing it from their side. We engage the shore staff, which is something we haven't necessarily done in the past in terms of eye learning where they can actually participate themselves. And, and it's proven to be something that will definitely be around for the future and will just develop further. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Julia. Uh, Jan, is the classroom dead? No, the classroom will start one day again. And uh, I'm quite sure that uh, training will continue because we all realize uh, how important training is. And uh, uh, the training for young uh, seafarers and cadets is the future. So uh, surely training will continue. Um, but uh, indeed, we had uh, last year, uh, March, April, May, our training centers were closed. We reopened again as from July and uh, we're forced to bring part of the classroom training into e-learning, uh, where, whereas other courses like welding, like safe mooring, uh, we continued outside. So it was uh, outside the classroom training, which uh, went quite well. But what uh, I'm actually most proud of is that we did not compromise on the training of cadets. So our cadet programs, which we started last year, uh, we uh, went through with it and continued and did not reduce the numbers. And I believe this is a good investment into the future because the cadets will be our future. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Valid comment, indeed. Uh, Dimitri, short comment from your side. Uh, very shortly, yes. I mean, of course, we've also adopted e-learning. Um, the classroom is not dead, uh, for sure not. I think it's not just about training. It's also about uh, the culture. So bringing people into the culture, making them feel part of the family. So, you know, you, you need the personal touch. Uh, I believe the future will be a hybrid uh, from yep. the positives of both sides. And uh, ultimately, I think we will be better than what we were before because of the lessons we've learned and the initiatives we've taken. So I think the future looks quite good once we get back to some normalized situation. Thank you, George. Dimitri, many thanks. Uh, Christo, your remarks? Uh, the same as the, as the rest of the panel. Uh, we moved about 90% of our training, especially from hotel operations to e-learning. We have the Royal Caribbean University. Uh, we have the app that we use. Uh, you can do it on a tablet or your web page. But the classroom is not finished. Uh, and we are looking forward to go back on board and do the training in the classroom, get to know our colleagues and get to know other, the people that we work with. The maritime way training is more specialized and of course the classroom will not be finished and it will carry on. But I think it will be a hybrid uh, uh, you know, uh, training that we will do a lot of e-training, but also classroom training. But it is very critical in, in, uh, critically important that we follow up with that. Yeah, okay. So classroom uh, not dead. I'm happy you, you agree. Uh, all of you together, because I'm, I'm a big supporter of that, especially what Dimitri says. I can see that there is an element of culture and exchange in being physically in the same room and exchanging views that you don't have it in the uh, digital way. However, I recognize that you can have synergies when you have uh, the digital training. Uh, people from all around the world, different locations at the same time, uh, more people probably uh, in a cost effective manner. So, uh, with that, I think uh, we will close uh, this panel. Uh, I will uh, welcome uh, Nicolas uh, to have a closing uh, comment. And if we have some time, maybe, uh, if there is some time for Mr. Dimitriades to say a few words and uh, close the session. And from my side, uh, thank you, Julia, Dimitri, uh, Jan, Christo, and of course, Nicolas for the invitation. Thank you to all uh, very much. Uh, thank you, George, for being the moderator. Jan, Julia, Christos, and Dimitri. Um, we are out of time, but uh, we can always find a minute or two for the minister if you would like to provide uh, a closing remark. Thank you, Nicola, as well. I'll be brief. Very interesting discussion on seafarers' welfare, on training. And uh, I would like to encourage uh, the panelists and also our viewers uh, to submit uh, their views, their contributions on our consultation exercise on what they expect from uh, Cyprus Maritime Administration uh, to do to have a more uh, effective uh, approach, uh, an efficient framework uh, to promote the CFRS welfare or uh, further training. And a final word on the vaccination and what's happening in Brussels. Just to share with you our approach is that we do believe the, uh, the whole thing, uh, there is a, a need for share a joint responsibility. And our uh, suggestion is mainly that the way we can do it collectively is that all, all countries globally for their spare vaccines, instead, instead of just returning them to this uh, so-called COVAX facility for third countries, they, they could secure a part of it for seafarers. And then if, if uh, the, these uh, vaccines are allocated to different hubs, then Cyprus could play again an important role. So thank you for having me today and all the best to the, to the remaining of today's panel discussions. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you very much.